Hi, I'm Samantha Rund, and this is UW 360. Today, we'll tell you about a lab that uses lightning strikes to make safer cars, the UW alum who helped bring the farmer's market to Seattle neighborhoods, and the new Center for Pediatric Dentistry. We'll show you some amazing ocean research video, introduce you to a second generation Husky freshman, and say goodbye to President Mark Emmert. Now in our first story, we're going to discuss the potentially disastrous results of building homes and businesses along flood-prone rivers. UW researchers question our ability as to whether or not we can control flooding in the Puget Sound's lowland rivers, and they offer suggestions about what we could do differently. We've seen it too often in the Puget Sound region. Rivers flood, property is damaged or destroyed, and lives are disrupted. So how do we avoid future disasters? One would argue, one would hope, that the best policy would be based on the most information. University of Washington faculty members Dave Montgomery and Bob Freitag are experts about rivers and about the communities that line their banks. Dave is a geomorphologist. He studies how Earth's landscapes are formed and how they change over time. Bob studies hazards and how humans can withstand those hazards. All rivers flood, uh, but when they, when they do flood, uh, we've tried to kind of control them and kind of put them into uh, to a box. We've you know, developed a channel, we've built dams, uh, assuming that we really can manage and control them, and we can't. One of the reasons that uh, one would study the historical behavior of rivers and sort of the nature of how they work is to try and better understand the root causes of flooding problems and better design solutions, whether it's avoiding the problem or a better design to actually mitigate the problem. Bob's and Dave's research converges in the lowlands of Puget Sound, where the Green and some other rivers are actually higher than the land surrounding them. One of the things we've learned in studying rivers around Puget Sound over the last couple decades is that there's really two very fundamentally different kinds. We tend to think of rivers always being at the bottom of the valley because that's sort of normally what you find when you go out in the mountains and look at a river. But these certain kinds of lowland rivers, of which the Green River is an example, tends to be uh, located on high ground near the middle of the valley. It sort of has built its own wedge of sediment as it's been transporting material down from the uplands down to the Puget Lowland. And a river that sits above its valley bottom, that's a recipe for flooding. Land use planning needs to consider the unique and potentially dangerous nature of our rivers. Perched rivers, when they flood, fill the surrounding basin with water. In the lowest points of the Green River Valley, floodwaters could cover the roof of a home. Picture New Orleans after Katrina, or picture the Green River Valley until the year 1962. In that year, the Howard Hansen Dam was completed. To control flooding, the dam held back excess water in a reservoir. A system of levees at the river's edge provided additional flood protection. As a result, over the next 50 years, the Green River Valley transformed from a landscape filled with farms to one filled with business and residential developments. As long as the, the dam was working, the system worked pretty well. It did not allow high flows to impact the, the region. A lot of the floods were cut off. But in 2009, after a winter of deep snow and heavy rains, leaks appeared in an earthen abutment anchoring the dam, severely compromising its structural integrity. With a primary failsafe protecting the Green River Valley no longer fully functional, the valley now faces the potential return of catastrophic floods. The water would uh, really reach to about where that black panel of glass is, that row, and uh, the building would be filled with water. The building really should not have been here this area was a natural storage area, natural wetland, but it was built here when there was the perception that this area was protected, that the dam would work and the levee system would work. Now what can they do? Well, currently what's being suggested for these people really is to have a contingency plan, uh, to have a plan where they have their, door, their, their data storage elsewhere, where they have uh, people uh, experience to operate out of their home for a short period of time where materials can be stored. The Green River is a poster child for sort of some of the downside of flood control for the simple reason that when the flood control system was designed it was promised to essentially cut off all high flows so you'd never have to worry about the valley bottom being flooded again. Uh, sounds great as long as it works. The research conducted by Dave and Bob questions the advisability of placing millions of dollars of businesses and homes in harm's way. 
Instead, policymakers should read the landscape and design development around inevitable flooding. For instance, along the Green River, Bob suggests moving levees back from the river's edge and allowing lower, undeveloped areas to flood. This would store water that would otherwise spread across the landscape. They're going to have to restructure uh, the environment to accept more flooding, to move the levees back, and to really create areas, overflow areas within the community uh, that are really lower than the river to accept some of this flow. Bob also suggests developed areas be designed with floods in mind. You can elevate structures within those areas and have a, a rescue system or an evacuation system that can accommodate flooding. And in areas that aren't yet as developed as the Green River Valley, there are other design options. You can build an environment of parks and waterways and canals and uh, streets that can accommodate water. The Netherlands have done it. Uh, you know, we have done it in some of the areas, and so this is possible. But we have to think of uh, a flood-resistant community. The best strategy, say Bob and Dave, is to respect the geology of our peculiar perched rivers and acknowledge that no flood control measures are foolproof. The estimates of a, you know, a levee breach kind of flood in the Green River Valley are you're talking billions of dollars worth of damage. Is it worth it in the end? That's the kind of question that's pertinent to sort of looking at flood control on other rivers around Puget Sound because 50 years from now, people may look back and sort of wonder why we didn't learn the lesson of the Green River in terms of managing the other rivers around Puget Sound. That's the real value of sort of looking at how the topography works, how the physiography works, how the geomorphology works, and trying to connect it to public policy. From rivers to the sea, our next story takes us to the Pacific Ocean on the research vessel, the Thomas G. Thompson. The Enlightened 10 crews was the kickoff voyage to establish a network of undersea research stations that would revolutionize the way we study the ocean. Yeah, it's the deck. Uh, we're all set down here. We're just waiting for the umbilicals to be disconnected and uh, we'll be getting ready to launch it directly. In late July 2010, a team of researchers set sail from the University of Washington to study sites off the coasts of Washington and Oregon. Called the Enlightened 10 Crews, the onboard team of scientists and engineers helped launch a revolution in how we study and understand the oceans. The primary objective to gather high-resolution images and data from four sites. The goal, find the best routes and locations for a high-bandwidth network of cables, sensors, and instrumented moorings. The ultimate vision, continuous 24-7, 365 exploration of the chemical, biological, and geological interactions happening in our oceans for decades. And the best part is, that information will come straight from the ocean to a computer near you. We will be able to beam the kinds of things that we are doing into the, not just the laboratories, but the classrooms and the living rooms of the world that's connected to the internet. The University of Washington is the implementing organization for a piece of what will eventually be a globally linked network of experimental sites in the oceans. The larger global network is called the Ocean Observatories Initiative and is funded by the National Science Foundation. The UW is leading a sub-network called the Regional Scale Nodes, or RSN. We're very, very excited to have been selected as the group to not just design, but to construct and eventually operate this portion of the system. The RSN will span the Juan de Fuca tectonic plate and include a cabled array of sensors on the seafloor, below the seafloor, and throughout the water column. The Enlightened 10 team used remotely operated vehicle Jason 2 and the autonomous underwater vehicle Sentry to determine where the cables and sensors could be placed to minimize risk. The main function is to find the specific sites where the instruments go, so we have to pick very precisely where the cables are going to be and where the sensors are going to be, and so this was really the first crews to do that. This really laid the foundation for the program. The team mapped two coastal sites, investigated a methane seep, and then went 280 miles offshore to survey an underwater volcano. One day, anyone with an internet connection will be able to see for themselves the complex interactions involved in giant storms or erupting undersea volcanoes and the many other wonders of Earth's oceans. The oceans are, without question, the, the, the basic life support system for, for the planet. 
if we don't treat it carefully, understand it well, and uh, respect it, in time, it is finite and uh, we can exhaust it. So we hope to fundamentally shift the awareness level of literally hundreds of millions of people on the planet about how crucial the oceans are and how important it is for us to understand the oceans. In the Lamborghini lab here on campus, researchers use lightning strike generators and car crushing crash sleds in the quest to create lighter and safer cars and airplanes. So what we're going to do is shoot from that little gun inside of there, then the projector will hit that composite panel right there. Welcome to a lab on the University of Washington campus where it's not make or break, it's make and break. This is the Automobili Lamborghini Advanced Composite Structures Laboratory, or as it's commonly known, the Lamborghini Lab. It's a collaboration between Lamborghini, the UW, and Boeing for the development and testing of carbon fiber composites. Paolo Farabili directs the lab. There are many types of composites, like glass fiber, um, even plywood is a composite. But the modern age advanced composites used for aircraft and automotive applications mostly refer to carbon fiber composites. Carbon fiber composites are lightweight and strong, big pluses for aircraft and car manufacturers. The downside? They're expensive to make, and small changes in their formulations or shapes can drastically affect performance. University of Washington students and researchers are pushing the envelope of composite design and adaptability while testing these composites to the limit. Working closely with industry, the lab plays a key role in determining how composites can be made so they don't break, and if they do, how to repair them efficiently. The research has impacted both the newest Lamborghini model and the Boeing 787. In the future, it may pave the way for the kind of lighter, fuel-efficient passenger cars that won't crumple easily in a crash. There's no other place that combines in one single location all that equipment that's utilized to assess the ability of composite to withstand damage. There are also very few labs where graduate students are able to take a project quickly from product to testing to analysis. And all of that impact testing equipment at the lab the graduate students designed, purchased, and installed that, too. We get involved with industry and academia, and um, you know, we, we kind of taste a little bit of everything um, with, on the business side. So it's a constant learning experience on all fronts. Some of the latest work out of this lab includes developing composites that can better withstand lightning strikes and experimenting with ways to integrate wireless devices and composites. Imagine a car with sensors and electronics powered by devices molded right into the composites of its body. Transmitting data and power through the carbon fiber where the, the sensors are, it's a challenging task uh, because carbon is conductive. I think the most important thing in this lab is that the approach is we want the students' imagination to be the limit and not resources nor uh, other constraints. Their desire to learn and their desire to explore new things is only limited by the amount of time they can dedicate in their day to do it. Otherwise, we try to make every possible resource available to make it happen. The UW's Lamborghini Lab. It's a place with no limits on imagination or dedication. A place where breaking things means building a better future. During the week, this is just a parking lot. But on Saturday mornings, it turns into the U District Farmer's Market. You can get fruit, fish, vegetables, flowers, everything you need to make the perfect dinner. Thousands of people start their weekend at the U District Farmer's Market in Seattle. Chris Curtis opened the Saturday morning market 17 years ago. We like the farmers. We like getting vegetables from the farmers. Uh, we like the freshness. Food addicted. 
Nice job with the display. Yeah. When you see Chris Curtis in action, you understand how she was able to grow the U District Farmers Market into a movement that swept the city and has helped fuel a farmers market trend nationwide. You've got Honey Crisp today. She's passionate about food, sustainability, and the market experience. It always looks so nice. Curtis is the director of the Neighborhood Farmers Market Alliance in Seattle. The organization now operates seven different markets throughout the city. It's amazing what the farmers market movement has done for the city of Seattle. Hundreds of thousands of Seattle shoppers access these farmers markets every week. We started off with 17 farmers 17 years ago. And we now have like close to 120 in our database and they're probably close to 200 that come into the city of Seattle every single week to sell directly to Seattle shoppers. I mean, it has changed the shape and scope and face of food and agriculture in significant ways. And no, I don't step back and reflect on that enough, but I should. Curtis started this first market within easy reach of the University of Washington campus, 20 years after she graduated. As a small business owner in the area, the former Husky already had longtime ties to the U District Chamber of Commerce. Have you got more cycle pairs than before? An interest in civic activism fostered by her studies in anthropology and sociology at the UW helped fuel an ambitious plan. When we started out, and as I say, it was a grassroots seat of our pants uh, project, we hadn't organized a farmer's market before. We had to rely on other farmer's markets and their advice and their best management practices. Um, I had to call on the community to, for support, and the university has been supportive from day one. It's been an important connection, and I think uh, the university is proud that they have such a wonderful farmer's market in their neighborhood and in their midst. She started doing this back when it wasn't chic. And she, more than anybody I know, created this, worked out what do you need to make a market successful. She's encouraged farmers along the way. She's cajoled city government and state government and the federal government to see the pieces of the community puzzle that a farmer's market can be. So those are also 350 a pound. About 500 to 900 paychecks rely on the network of farmers markets that Chris Curtis has created. If it hadn't been for her hard work and part of her vision and her just perseverance, um, 80, 90 percent of these small farms you see here probably wouldn't be in existence. Uh, that's a pretty good legacy if you rack it all up. Curtis's other legacy is the farmers market community. This is the new town square. Farmer's Market does make a difference. Not only do neighbors see neighbors here, and they take the time to stop and chat and say, how are you, and actually sit down, maybe share a cup of coffee, but they, shoppers also get to know the farmers, and the farmers get to know the shoppers. I have this saying that I always tell everybody. I have the world's best job. I get to grow things, I come here, people hand me money, smile at me, and thank me for what I do. Absolutely doesn't get any better. If you don't know how to define community, come here. The salmon was caught on Tuesday at Point Roberts. Okay, that's very close. Chris Curtis never imagined her vision for a farmer's market would transform so many lives the way it has. Who's that for? My wife. Her food revolution has changed the way Seattle and its rural neighbors work and live together. Every day, I, I'm very, very happy for what I do. It's the best job I've ever had. From the moment of birth, parents are thinking about how to keep their children safe and healthy. And good dental care is an essential part of that, starting with those first baby teeth. Our next story takes us to the new Center for Pediatric Dentistry, where Seattle Children's and the University of Washington team up for comprehensive care and cavity prevention. When your baby gives you that first tiny toothless smile, you're probably a long way from thinking about cavities. But by the time she's a toddler, those little teeth need care. Our main message is first visit by first birthday. Because if we can see the children as soon as their teeth come into the mouth and get the families engaged in this preventive effort, we can get them on a course of being cavity free for the rest of their life. Everything's looking good, you are brushing better. At the University of Washington, Dr. Joel Berg pays serious attention to early childhood oral health. Cavities are essentially preventable. We're dealing with what is really a preventable disease. We spend in this country 
uh, children and adults, about $60 billion a year related to cavities. It's, it's a very expensive disease. It's very, uh, it's, it's expensive in terms of cost and also in terms of what happens to the children who suffer from cavities. So it's, it's a real life affecting problem. But my favorite thing to see is a clean, healthy tooth. Problems with teeth can make chewing and even speaking difficult. Untreated cavities can spread infection into the jaw, seriously affecting a child's overall health. Teaching families how to prevent cavities and treating problems early is one of the primary goals of the Center for Pediatric Dentistry. The Center, a partnership between the UW and Seattle Children's, brings together expert providers and the latest in technology. This is a state-of-the-art dental office for children. We have all the latest technology, we have all the experts from various disciplines in pediatric dental care, pediatric dentists with various expertises, oral surgeons, craniofacial orthodontists, root canal specialists who have expertise with children, gum periodontal experts who have expertise with children, all that under one roof, and the latest technology for those doctors to provide the best care for the children in the center. There's an academic side to the center as well, as Dr. Berg and his colleagues educate future pediatric dentists. And while caring for their young patients in Seattle, the team studies how to bring that level of care to children far away. The mission of the center is to deliver great quality care in an efficient way to as many children as we can here, to prevent as much disease as we can, and then to publish those methods, those best practices, so that we can show others how to deliver the same level of care in many other locations around the country and around the world. That's what the Center for Pediatric Dentistry is about. In September, the UW transforms from the quiet of summer study into a swarming mass of students searching for their way to class. It's exciting and can be a little intimidating to be a freshman in the middle of the mob, but not for second generation Husky Daily Baker. My suitcase. It's move-in day on the University of Washington campus and Mercer Hall is packed with new students. Daily Baker is one of this year's incoming freshmen. So now that you're here, yeah. how do you feel? I'm excited. Yeah. I don't know, my dorm's kind of, I made it cute, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it does look cute. Yeah, it does I'm, look like, I'm cute. excited to start school. Yeah. Well, I'm very proud of Daily. She's uh, a very special young lady, I, although I think all my kids are, are special. Daily's achieved a lot. She ran track and did well in school. And she has a lot of friends and, you know, she's a go-getter. Tries hard, doesn't give up, and she's very positive. What time is practice? Because I want to come to cheer. Is it Not only did Daily run track in high school, she was also an honor student and a cheerleader for Garfield High School. Y-E-L-L, Bulldog, Jeff, G-H-S. Why do you want me to empty the dishwasher? Because it needs to be empty. Daly is the third of six kids, and having a large supportive family gives her an advantage from the start. Education is always really stressed in our house because my parents always talk about we need to go to college, everyone needs to do a four year. Like we always need to try our hardest. And I think that's why another reason why we all took like AP in high school. Daly was accepted to an array of universities, but the UW is a special place for her parents. My wife and I, we met at the UW. I met her brother first and I asked him, who's that young lady? And he said, oh, that's my sister. And I go, okay. She was a special young lady and, you know, we fell in love and got married. And of course they wanted me to go to UW because what it came down to was UW and Howard. And Howard's like all the way across, you know, in um, Washington, D.C. But I chose um, the UW not just because of them, but like I love the UW and like it's here, you know, so. Yeah, but they wanted me to go to UW ever since day one. <laughs> Is that everything? Yeah. Everyone who knows Daly knows the University of Washington is a good fit for her. I think she will be well respected by her teachers as well as uh, her fellow students. And universities need to have that. They're not just ivory walls. They're supposed to be a reflection of what the society is. And I think Daly will bring a good reflection of that society to the UW. You like all the pink yeah. I put in here? <laughs> I think the UW is just going to open doors for her. She might be the next president in 10 years. But it's not just her parents' enthusiasm that has Daly ready to start classes this fall. I'm excited to like have the opportunity 
to just meet new people and ha like be open to new ideas and learn new things and like figure out what I want to do with myself and how I can better the society and stuff like that. As students are returning back to campus, we're saying goodbye to President Mark Emmert. In October, he's leaving the University of Washington to become the NCAA's new president. We wish him well and we'll miss him greatly. Here's a fond look back at the University of Washington's Emmert years. Innovation, change, and growth were the hallmarks of the Emmert years at the University of Washington. His passionate support for the environment, innovation, health, and global citizenship are great examples of how we all benefited from his leadership. True to his roots as a Northwest native, the environment was one of his high priorities. Back in 1861, no one was worried about global climate change or massive urbanization or transportation problems or the sustainability of our environment. Along with these great challenges for our planet come some remarkable opportunities for the University of Washington. I'm hard pressed to think of another university that has a better collection of faculty, staff, and students already working in the areas of environmental studies, global climate change, all of the issues around sustainability of our planet. That's why we want to create the new College of the Environment. Technological innovation and the UW's role in the business community were the centerpiece of many initiatives. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this, our first ever eye to eye meeting. It's an opportunity for us to think about ideas to innovation and the university's role in partnership with the business community and the state and the citizenry to help build a better Washington for all of our citizens. Students were always at the center of his efforts, and world leaders created defining moments in their lives. It is our distinct privilege to be part of the Dalai Lama's historic five-day visit to Seattle and to offer our support for his efforts to sow the seeds of compassion in the hearts and minds of today's youth and for generations to come. Uh, you, the new generation, generation of 21st century, now you are our hope you will create a century of peace. By recruiting the brightest minds in medicine and engineering and building leading edge laboratories, he strengthened the Northwest as a nexus of global health research. This building, of course, is, is a, a wonderful exemplar of what the UW is all about. It's an example of what the university can do in terms of interdisciplinary collaboration, in terms of focusing its great intellectual resources on problems that really matter to the world around us. It's an exemplar of, of this university's willingness to step up to the table and take on the biggest, most interesting, most exciting challenges scientifically, intellectually, and globally that we possibly can do. Goodbye and good luck to Mark Emmer. And that's it for the October edition of UW360. We'll bring you new stories every month, so look for us again in November. Or if you just can't wait, you can watch this episode again on uwtv.org. Thanks for watching.